whether you're a beginner or even an experienced player, you're going to gain some insight from these five tips. Here are the five biggest technique lessons I would give my beginner self if I could go back in time. There are a whole bunch of little technical details that often get overlooked in your playing. Even if you've taken lessons for years, even if you've you know, taken online courses and you've watched YouTube videos, you've learned, a lot of times there are little things that are just easy to miss and they tend to be those nagging issues that can potentially wreak havoc in your playing in a lot of big obvious ways, but the root cause of those problems a lot of times isn't so obvious. So I hope that one of these five technical tips today will hit one of those spots because this is the way they were for me. Eventually when I went back and revisited some of these things over the years, I was able to fix issues in my playing that I didn't even know existed because of these problems going on. So I hope one of these, if not all these, will resonate with you. And also at the end of today's lesson, I'm gonna give you a tip for finding out if you're guilty of any of these issues and if you need to spend some time working on them because you know this is only so good if you don't actually know how to identify these things in your playing and how to know what you need to focus on. So I'll help you do that. Drumming technique lesson number five. Thumb placement is everything. This is so key. So important to have your thumb at the right spot on the stick. Now, if you're playing like a thumbs up grip, of course the thumb is gonna be on top and that's its own kind of thing. And I do do this a lot with my right hand on the ride, but for the most part, default grip is more of a palms down, not a strict German style palms down, but kind of a loose in between like this. The thing that I see the most in my students, especially when they're getting started or they're trying to you know, just work on fixing their grip and getting better rebound, a lot of times the thumb is more like right here, where it's kind of on the side of the stick rather than beneath it. Really what you need is for your thumb to be part of cradling the stick, not pinching the stick. You never wanna pinch the stick. And if the thumb is too far toward the top, well that's gonna keep rebound from ever happening. This is no good. But if you start to lower it, okay, we're getting a little better. But now once it's down here, suddenly your hand opens up and you have space here, which allows the stick to bounce. And kind of in addition to thumb placement as everything, because that is extremely important, you can also practice letting your pivot point, your fulcrum, be with your middle finger instead of with your index. Because when you get the index finger out of the way, it opens up the space in your hand more so that you can actually get better rebound. Sometimes the index finger causes the issues. So most of the time thumb placement is the issue. Sometimes it's the index finger just being too tight. Because in this case right here, it's, this is too tight right here, it's not loose enough. We want the hand to be loose and open so the stick can move within the hand. So we can play big, fast, loud, powerfully, and effortlessly. That's kind of the key. So get that thumb in the right spot there where it's more underneath, so it's kind of the side of your thumb against the stick. The stick is just resting in your hand and practice using the middle finger for your fulcrum. Tip number four, don't slide your foot too far up your bass drum pedal foot plate. I was guilty of this for a long time and I had to do sort of a, a foot technique reevaluation when I came to a point where I was having a lot of knee pain and just, I wasn't able to bounce the beater when I wanted to bounce it, it was just always burying. And so what I did, I sat a little further back, gave my legs some more room because I'm a heel down player and I'm tall, so I need a lot of space. And that way I was able to not have my foot totally pushed against the chain. Because what happens if you've got your foot pushed against the chain, it's actually gonna be harder to play loudly because you're all the way up there at the end of the foot plate, which means you've gotta move, your foot has to move more to, to get a lot of beater motion. Versus if you're down here, obviously your foot doesn't have to move as much, but there's a sweet spot because you do want the right amount of leverage. If you're down here, then yeah, there might not be quite enough leverage. If you're up here, well, there's the leverage. It's easy to push down, but it's harder to play loud and actually harder to play fast because your foot has to move more. So my big technique mistake was being too far up here. So I slid back to about right here. With a DW pedal, that's where you can kind of see the top of the D, maybe the top of the W. And I'm a shoe size 11, and my heel is pretty much on the heel plate. And that's my sweet spot for playing heel down. That's what works for me. It's gonna be different for everybody, but find that sweet spot for you where your foot's not all the way up the pedal, but it's not so far back that you can't play. And if this feels stiff to you and feels more difficult, practice this. Strive to build up foot strength so that it's okay to have a little bit less leverage because then you'll actually have more speed and power. So use muscle strength in your leg, in your foot, in your ankle so that you're not having to be way up here because I think this is how I was compensating also for a lack of strength. And so if you can be down here, you're actually gonna be better off. For more detail on this, check out a previous video I did, the number one 
tip for speed success on the kick drum, no matter what technique you're using. And uh, we talk a lot about just bass drum technique in general. Um, so check that out, it's in the description. Also, if you're trying to play quick doubles on the kick, you don't wanna start way up here. That actually makes it more difficult. But if you're down here, you can play the first note at that point on the pedal and then skip up a little bit because you have room to skip up. That's kind of my variation of heel-toe, I guess. Um, that's kind of the way I just tend to play. And actually, as I get going, my foot isn't sliding back and forth much. I kind of just find my comfort zone where I'm planted here. And that's what works. So practice doing that loudly, cleanly, with your foot not way up here. Not way down here, but find that sweet spot in between. Work on building up the foot strength you need to do that. But again, check out that previous video for more detail on this. Tip number three, this is a really big one. This was huge for me in my grooving and in my hi-hat playing. And it's this, when you're gonna play quickly and lightly on the hats, like if you're trying to, if you're going for like a Rosanna shuffle kind of hi-hat feel, don't play like this. Don't play your closed hat notes this way. This might be fine for big, loud, open eighth notes or quarter notes. But if you're gonna play more quickly, you've gotta lessen that angle. That just feels clumsy. It doesn't at all feel effortless. But if we lessen the angle, come to about here, so really it's more the neck of the stick than the shoulder of the stick, suddenly we get more rebound and response out of the hats and it's a more light, just flowing kind of natural feel because we have more physics helping us out. It makes such a difference in hi-hat response. And also when you're playing closed hats, don't have them closed super tight. Relax your left foot a little bit so you're not pressing down really tight. And that's gonna help too with just smoothening out the sound so that it doesn't sound too staccato. So those things combine a little bit less left foot pressure, play less angle instead of here, more toward the neck of the stick. And that's gonna help a lot with those hi-hat 16th patterns. Tip number two, don't use the shaft of the stick when you're playing crashes. It's really easy when you're playing a crash, when you're wanting to be really loud, to dig in like this. And that does work okay with larger cymbals where you need a little bit more weight and momentum to get into them. But if the cymbal's smaller, especially like this 18 inch K Custom Dark right here, it's a light cymbal, it's a thin cymbal, you don't need to do that. And actually with thinner cymbals, you don't wanna do that. It's better to use just the shoulder of the stick and swipe. So rather than that, we wanna just go more like that. That way the cymbal is actually resonating more, not swinging more than it needs to. Plus, if we're gonna ride on a crash or we're gonna like crash and wash on the ride, that's gonna help keep the cymbal from swinging back and forth. I'll A-B this so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. You get the idea there. It just gets crazy depending on what tempo you're at. Now some tempos, yeah, you can get away with shafting it a little more, but at that tempo, that's like the tempo that these cymbals want to swing at. Boom, 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 boom. And so you have to do something about it. Sometimes throw in some eighths there instead of one, two, throw in a one and two and to help offset the swing. But in general, when you can go to a less steep angle, go more to the end of the stick, the stick isn't pushing as much through the cymbal. So you get a great cymbal sound without it swinging back and forth so much. Also potentially a louder cymbal sound, just a better cymbal sound in general. That was something that it took me too long to realize, but it's one of those little technical details 
nobody's going to talk about that in a drum lesson, but it's something that shows up in recording and you know, when you're hitting cymbals a lot and you're having to play loud, you're maybe needing to hit cymbals loudly, but you're not really getting the response from them that you want, that's the way to do it. All right, number one, this is probably my favorite technique tip, and it's something that nobody ever really taught me, and it's also not something that I stumbled upon. It was something that uh, a fellow musician when I was in college happened to do when he was playing the drum set. I saw him do it. He wasn't even really a drummer. He was a guitar player, but we were just jamming, hanging out. He sat down and played something on the kit, and I noticed that he was keeping time with his left foot while playing, and he was doing it by bouncing his left leg. Now, I'm a heel down player, and I've always liked playing heel down on the kick, and so my method of timekeeping with my left foot was also heel down, and so I was trying to play something like. It just felt a little bit cumbersome. I felt like I couldn't do that very effortlessly, and somehow it never occurred to me, well, just lift up your heel. Lift up your heel, and suddenly you can do a little bit of bouncing and actually have better dynamic control by keeping your toe planted. And so I kind of took what I saw my friend do that day and, and I ran with it and played around with this and I figured out a lot of different ways to use what I now call the leg bounce. That's all it is, you're bouncing your leg, you're keeping your toe planted, keep your toe planted on the foot plate, not too far up, kind of that same sweet spot like we were talking about over here with the right foot. Find that sweet spot and you're just bouncing your heel. Keep a lot of pressure on your toe if you wanna just keep time and barely hear anything, but then start to lessen that pressure or punctuate the pressure more. I should clarify that when I say punctuate the pressure more. If we were gonna do ands. That's what we're doing where it's kinda of like we're playing an air note and then we're going down more firmly to actually play the note. So let me do a little bit, a little bit more demonstrating here so you can see more of what I'm talking about rather than me explaining it more. So again, you're keeping your big toe planted unless you're going to splashes. That's where you're really lifting off. And the amount of pressure that you're maintaining on your big toe determines how loud the chicks are. You can start to open the chicks up a little more by actually lessening the pressure but still bouncing your leg. And then by fully lifting your toe off in between, then you end up with the splashes. And so what this is, is it's a single motion. Learn the motion, the leg bounce, pivoting off of your toe, and that's all you need to know. And then you manipulate that motion to then get different degrees of chicks, to do quarters, to do ands, to do eights. You can do all that with that single motion. So that's very worth practicing. That's something I wish I'd learned sooner, but I was, I was happy once I discovered that because I was able to use that in so much of my playing. I use it all the time. For more on how to use this leg bounce technique, especially when you're playing open notes and cuts and stuff, go check out a previous video on hi-hat barks, like how to play clean hi-hat barks and open notes in the midst of a groove. Um, I break down in that lesson a whole bunch of exercises, basically a series of exercises that build off of one another to build up the ability to do that and to be able to go. That kind of thing tends to be tricky and harder than it really needs to be. So go check out that video if you wanna learn more about that. So follow these five technique tips, begin implementing them in your practicing and your playing. Then follow this action step I'm gonna give you as well as this additional resource I'm gonna show you here in a second. So I know that most of you watching this video are either self-taught or you're basically learning online, which means technically you're not self-taught, but self-taught meaning you haven't taken lessons. And these days, online learning is a great way to learn. Watching these YouTube videos, that's awesome. But if you're self-taught, it's tough to know exactly what you need to work on because you don't have a second set of eyes. You don't have somebody else there to evaluate you and critique you. So that means you've got to do that yourself. And the best way to do that is record yourself, video yourself, especially record yourself. And if you've got an electric drum set so you can record clean audio of yourself, that's great. If you've got an acoustic kit mic'd up, that's great. If you have an acoustic kit and no mics, 
that's, that's still okay. You can use your phone. You can record yourself with your phone. Most new phones do pretty good audio. So at least you can hear yourself enough to you know, hear if there's issues going on in your playing. But as far as technique goes, that's where the video really comes in handy. And if you video your hands, you know, playing singles with slow-mo, easy to do that on iPhone and probably any smartphone, slow-mo video and go back and watch it and you'll very distinctly see what's going on. Talking about thumb placement earlier, you'll see exactly where your thumb's at with some slow-mo video. You'll see where, you'll, where your fulcrum point is. Film your feet in slow motion. See what your feet are doing when you're trying to play fast and figure out what is it that's not right here? What is it that I need to fix? When you're working on the leg bounce, do that same thing. That's how you grow, that's how you critique yourself because you don't always have the luxury of having a teacher sitting there watching you and so this is how you can still grow even if you're self-taught or you're learning online. Also, if you're self-taught, most definitely grab my free guide, the three-part daily practice routine, know what to practice. Uh, this is the 30-minute daily routine for drummers with busy lives. Uh, this is a well-rounded practice routine that sums up all the key elements of productive practice into three parts, and you can get this done in 30 minutes every day. So check out the guide. We go into hand technique. We have a bunch of uh, key coordination exercises, like specific concrete exercises you can practice. And this guide alone will provide you with months or even years worth of things to practice as you're growing. And the best part is, it's totally free. So go grab that. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe. This is a channel all about giving you the core, non-glamorous drumming skills that really help you grow. I believe that when you're armed with the right resources and you have that mindset of taking action and implementing what you learn, nothing's gonna stop you. You're more capable of success on the drums than you think you are. Work ethic is more important than talent. So implement what we talked about today. Go download that guide. Simply taking action in that way is gonna reap a lot of results in your playing. And so be in that habit of taking action, of actually practicing this stuff because you, you will grow. You're capable of more than you think. So you can do this. Stay non-glamorous. I'll see you on the next video.